hi everyone. I'm Elise Rosemary and I'm a senior vice president here at ACAM. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're going to be discussing alteration agreements, best practices. Um, joining with me, I have um, my wonderful esteemed colleague, Chris Alker, as well as Juan Matisse. Um, Juan Matisse is an American Institute of Architects lead accredited professional and the founder of Matisse Architecture and Design. Um, so thank you so much for joining us tonight. And then of course, I've got our very own in-house architect who's been doing this for about 20 years. Is that right, Chris? Um, who's also our Vice President of Operations and Compliance. So welcome. Thank you so much for joining us, Chris. So we're going to get started. Um, so just as an overview of what we're going to be discussing this evening, we're going to be discussing the types and scope of alteration agreements, typical prohibited and required work, permits and essential paperwork, pra best practices for unit alterations, and then of course we'll do a QA. and a We invite you to put your questions as they come in the chat box, I'm sorry, not in the chat box, in the Q&A box, and we will get back to you as soon as we can, and of course we'll circulate our information after this. Um, with, there's so many people that have been asking about, you know, how to handle their alteration agreements. A lot of people have antiquated agreements. They want to know best practices. So I think this is a fabulous time to be talking about what types and scope um, should people be thinking about, especially as we move forward. So take it away. So um, we're going to talk about, so one of the biggest think questions that comes across in the management side is really, Hey, what type of agreement do I need? What do I, what's required? Do I have to file it? Is there a permit? What are the policies of the building and that sort of thing? So from a management side, there's, there's a few different buckets we're going to talk about. And then we're going to talk with um, Juan on find out from his experience uh, uh, with these different types of agreements. So the, the ones that, you know, the three big buckets here are no agreement, what things, you know, just don't require any sort of agreement at all. And this is, kind of on a building by building basis. And it's, hey, does the, you know, does the building require an agreement for that? Or is it okay to do that thing or not, right? There is a decoration agreement where the bucket of things where they say, you have to do an agreement, there's a fee associated with it, but you don't need a permit. Um, then there's alteration agreements. So alteration agreements are basically where it's considered above a decoration agreement, but you don't necessarily need a permit. And there's a whole section of the code that we'll talk about uh, that is, we won't go too into the weeds on it, but the long and short is there is a section of the code that says you can do all this work without a permit, for example. Uh, and then there's major alterations, meaning you must have a permit from uh, the city. Yeah, so sorry, really quick, Chris, just in case people aren't familiar with what kind of permit is required, can you just kind of go through that? We have a slide on that as well, um, but yeah. essentially, <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, we'll talk about that. We're gonna, we're gonna cover that for sure. Good question. Great. If you wanna go to the next slide. So, um, so these are typical things that we see where there is no re agreement required, things like modification to intercom, area rugs, window screens, hanging TVs, hardware, plug-in lighting, you know, putting your furniture, this is, this is basically like, I'm just going to put stuff in my apartment, you know, window screens, window treatments is probably a big one. I mean, arguably that might, could fall under a, a decoration agreement, uh, window treatments uh, here. We're saying screens, you know, replace the screen, throw an area rug, what have you. These are pretty, pretty self-explanatory. I don't think we go beyond that. It's, it's, again, it's up to the building. If you want to go next slide. Decoration agreements typically covers these things. These are finishes that don't require a permit. Wallpaper, painting, window treatments, um, swapping on my appliance, except gas appliances and tile and dry areas. Um, so I'm going to pause here for a second and, and loop in Juan on this one, because uh, this one comes up a lot on the appliances. So uh, Juan, in your experience, have you have you been? Uh, I know that obviously, if you're permitting a project, uh, you know everything is sort of covered under that permit, right? But have you had any issues with uh, any experience uh, swapping of gas appliances in apartments when it was just alone, or you ever roped into that work? Uh, well, usually uh, the gas appliances usually come in as a you know it's basically run out its life and it has to be replaced. The key thing is to make sure that you keep the dimensions consistent. A lot of times uh, people don't realize that you may be just going out to buy a range, for example, but the gas connection on the back of the unit in the wall can vary uh, based on how it was kind of put in at the building and not every, every range will fit back. And so uh, it's a detail that happens to be overlooked often 
and people arrive, the delivery, the appliance is coming in, they start pushing it back and all of a sudden they're like, hey, why can't it go back all the way? And all of a sudden they realize that the valve is 18 inches off the floor, uh, 12 inches off to the left, and the appliance has a hole that is naturally cap made for the, the gas, but it's actually along the bottom of the appliance. And so all of a sudden, somebody's got this range that's sticking four or five inches into their passer countertop. And most of the time, you got to return it because nobody wants to live with a big gap behind their range. So even the simplest of tasks, be very cautious with the dimensions and that the specs or the specifications that the manufacturers have. The PDF, take the extra time to take a look at it. And if you, I would suggest, Chris, that I think if somebody feels like they need a little bit of help, ask the super to take a look at the spec that they might see online and print it and have a look at it, measure it, and just double check because something as simple as that could wind up being something where you wind up having to purchase two different units, having to rebring it back down to the, you know, from the 15th floor back to the street, packaging it again. You probably threw away all the stuff, you know. And so just uh, I think even that is judicious. Um, the other appliance issue that I would flag is um, you can't just decide to have a gas appliance go out and think that you can put a, an electric burner or some other uh, electric consuming uh, uh, type top. Sounds like a great idea, but a lot of the older buildings in New York City uh, don't have the panel capacity at their apartments to just have that appliance also swap out. So it's always better, I think, and recommend that, uh, that any of the shareholders or board members make sure that they realize that just double checking things like that so that uh, it, you, you make sure that you're also not ordering uh, items that you really can't use. And I will tack on to that. If you are going to swap out a like-for-like -like appliance, especially with gas, um, you have to make sure that, and everybody hates this one, but you do, and, and it's not a part of a larger alteration, you must have a uh, you must have a limited alteration permit to replace a glass appliance. And the cost of hiring a licensed master plumber to do that often costs as much as the stove. Uh, this is a big point of contention when people are very upset. A lot of people, um, I don't understand why do I need to pay $1,500 for this when that's the cost of the stove. But that's currently the rule with the Department of Buildings. We've actually verified this with the Department of Buildings Plumbing Division. Um, it's very frustrating. Um, but the reason for this law, just so everybody knows, is because there's been issues with gas in the city and there's been um, some explosions in the past, not mainly because of a gas stove to be frank, but regardless, they've used this as an opportunity to check those vintage valves. They used to have old T valves and now they have you know new ball valves as the safer valve. And so they use that as an opportunity to sort of bring up compliance uh, in yeah, the I, units. I would add, Chris, that it's really uh, just a safety factor Many of the buildings that you probably have in your portfolio, a lot of them are 50 to 80 years old. The pipe that has never been rattled and touched, all of a sudden somebody who's not being very careful, they start shaking it and moving it in the cracks form. Maybe you can't get the gas to leak right away, but you know, three weeks later, three months later, all of a sudden that thing starts to have, uh, have an opportunity to come out. And so it, it also could be a very delayed uh, circumstances. And if you don't have a shutoff valve for the riser, you could impact uh, every unit line in your building, <laughs> which could be not so great. And uh, you don't want to cause a gas shutdown in your building. All right, let's jump to the next agreement. So this is the 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 two different types of agreement. Uh, so, I'm sorry. So this is so there's major alterations and minor alterations. So minor alterations would be as per the code minor alterations in ordinary repairs meaning stuff that were that may require an agreement with your building most likely but don't require a permit right so there's several things that you can do so removing demountable partitions notice it doesn't say mounting demountable partitions so pressurized wall for example uh, my understanding Juan, is that a pressurized wall um, still requires a permit correct uh, correct, because it does create separated spaces. Um, and so the other items you see here, you know, you can replace some finishes, you can redo your countertops, um, you know, millwork built-ins, custom millwork built-ins. I want to do a new radiator enclosure, acoustic windows, quiet windows, uh, radiators, um, and, and in some cases, window replacement. Um, these are all things that may not necessarily require a permit with the city, but potentially require, uh, you know, an agreement with your building, right? So a lot of people might say, how is it that I make this process less onerous? And you could say, well, if I look at this section of the code or have your designer review this section of the code, they can tell you, hey, if you want to keep the scope of work to this, 
we can make it a lot easier to get through the process because if anybody knows when you uh, have to file it with a permit, you have to go through the whole process of a plan exam and all that kind of good stuff where they object and make it, you know, you got to jump through some hoops. Um, so uh, Juan, why don't we talk about, look, interesting to know. So these are, these are several, I won't read all these. These are several quote prohibited works. So many of the buildings that we manage uh, prohibit work in their buildings from actually happening. Um, have you faced some of these items and maybe you can speak on a couple of them with regard to what's allowed and not allowed typically in buildings that you've worked in? Yeah, I mean, and I can talk quite at length. So at some point you may have to stop me about this topic, but <laughs> uh, I guess as architects, uh, we are contacted uh, by shareholders and clients and buildings of all types. A lot of times uh, they're very aware uh, of having, let's say, been a New York City resident and maybe participated in things like this before. What we find usually is a greater disconnect is a new shareholder who may be moving from suburbia or another part of the country or a part of the world. And they come with kind of their, their way of, of doing things and the kind of rules. And they're really surprised about the fact that you're in a dense populated city like New York, where people are living six inches above you, six inches below you and buildings next door. And, they, and it makes a lot of sense why, you know, you can't have a wood burning fireplace, a new one. Uh, and, and why you shouldn't have a propane grill uh, sitting outside of your window on your deck, right? And, and all of these, um, probably for most New Yorkers, kind of make, come, make a lot of sense. And so I think those sort of safety issues are, are probably the ones that uh, an outside arriving uh, resident is probably going to have a little bit more difficulty understanding, but they'll get it quickly. And then a, a, lot, of, a lot of folks just sort of don't realize that some of the things that they do uh, call it... Um, hot tubs here. It's like, why, why is a hot tub not? Well, guess what? There are jets and they create a lot of vibration, right? So all of a sudden, something as simple as a hot tub, you realize that, you know, it's how it transfers movement and vibration. And you turn on your jets and you're taking your bath, but downstairs, somebody thinks that there's somebody having a party uh, above every single time that you're trying to relax in your hot tub. And the same thing with the garbage disposals, the motors on things like that, the issues with them are multiple. It's not only the sound and the vibration of that along the pipe system. Because again, when you're using your sink in your kitchen, there's somebody who has a sink connected 10 feet away up and below you, right? So, it, so it's about learning how to be pretty good neighbors. So a lot of these things really have to do with just being respectful for the neighbors and also the building that you're life, all sharing. Life because safety, if everybody, right? if everybody in, the, in, the, in a residence, for example, did anything that they wanted, all of a sudden, you're, somebody might actually be making a larger hole in a underneath their toilet in, in a bathroom, or somebody makes an enormous uh, medicine cabinet situation in a wall, et cetera. Well, the, I was going to ask, yeah, I mean, the two things that used to come up when I was a former broker was always whatever dry, you know, as a selling point, the kitchen, you can move the kitchen, and actually you can't because this is why. Can you kind of describe, I mean, great it's not question. A few things innate, but, but why not? So, so the wet over dry um, is, is, is a rule that, um, that was another one I was going to comment. So uh, especially with bathrooms can overflow really easily. Uh, everyone's probably had an experience with a toilet bowl. Uh, and the idea that anybody then could have the bathroom over somebody else's expensive artwork or other aspects of it is really where the troubles come in. Uh, so keeping the water that would leak over another similar space is just going to minimize potential damage. Uh, and so that's really a critical thing. Uh, and then there's the issue of a toilet flushing over the person who might be sleeping. And so you're also, again, acoustics, I think, is the one that least uh, people rationalize with. But it is, in fact, the one of the more impactful quality of life issues if you're sharing a, a residence in a building. As far as the kitchens are concerned, um, there's less or there's a little bit more wiggle room on what is the kitchen and the floor area that a kitchen has relative to, let's say, an eat-in area or maybe a countertop extension. Um, and But the key is really keeping the appliances that are the sink, the dishwasher, and a refrigerator that may have a connection to a uh, water uh, source. Those are the critical items. And of course, the range with its gas line, those have to be within the footprint of the kitchen. But we have seen that you know it's possible to kind of uh, say that an extension of a peninsula or a kitchen or something like that depending on the floor surface can be a variable. But generally speaking, respecting the footprints on a building, especially when the lines are consistent, is really a, about maybe making sure that you're a good neighbor as well. 
Right. So I think a lot of these laws seem to stem from being good neighbor as opposed to, and, and potentially damaging outside of your greater space. Like what about modification of intercom? That's surprising. Uh, most intercoms are usually sitting on, uh, you know, quietly on the wall as soon as you open your door. Uh, and, and the wiring for that is usually tied together very quickly to your neighbors. And that's why those systems actually, most of the time we advise our clients just to leave it alone. Um, yeah, because I mean, what about defunct ones that are just, you can't remember them? Well, if it's, exactly. if it's defunct, I suppose it's a different issue. Although there is a multiple dwelling law that requires that a functioning intercom be in uh, units. However, it seems that with new modern technology and things like building link and cell phones, a lot of that is being bypassed. We haven't seen a ton of violations on that, but but the multiple drilling law does require a functioning intercom uh, for buildings. Mm -hmm. I, I would also say that those are the kinds of details that somebody would be like, oh, that's such a minor thing. I'll just have I, my contractor rip it out and yeah, it. guess exactly. what? Yeah, when they do that, all of a sudden there's 40 apartments whose intercom is no longer working. And so even what you seem to think is like a really innocent thing to do, uh, a lot of those systems have very delicate wiring and it actually is going to be going through your intercom and the main line might be literally two inches behind that. And if you don't do that carefully, you could be responsible for having a lot of upset neighbors. And I think also another thing that used to come up all the time when I was a broker was structural changes. I think a lot of people, at least when I was a broker, you'd tap on the wall. Does it seem like it's structural? But I'm sure outside, I'm just tapping on the wall. Is there other approaches to no knowing what's structural versus non-structural? So this is one that is also very surprising to most people, as Chris said, the Department of Buildings and the code interprets that even a stud wall is, quote unquote, a structural member, which is why modifying a wall and taking down a wall or putting up a wall is considered a permittable requirement. Uh, and it's the same if it's a uh, 1950s uh, cinder, uh, you know, plaster block that's three inches thick to a metal frame stud wall, or if it's a plaster wall, the steel B just sees that as a partition or a wall surface that is technically quote unquote self-structural or structural. Mm -hmm. The heavy structural elements, like you were saying, are the columns, the perimeter right. walls and other things. And the key there is that um, those are the ones that you really can't touch. Just like I would say that I would put in the same category, the risers that are the second item on the top left side, mm -hmm. those are also critical. The risers of the building, which are connecting everybody's plumbing vertically or the ventilation for all of the systems, those have to be considered almost like columns as in the fact that you really can't really touch those or move them. And when we're renovating larger projects, which we'll get to in a second, I guess, in a, in a slide or two, uh, those are the kinds of things that make the most sacrifices required when people are trying to lay out because those are the non-movable objects. Right. And one last item that I had a question on was expanding into common areas. So I remember I did a big renovation actually in my own apartment and we ended up buying hallway space, but it was the first time that we had building had ever permitted that. So do you want to come speak on that a little bit too? Yes, we've had that happen on many occasions, especially when people are combining units, because mm -hmm. what happens right. is that the opportunity arises that the two doors that are, let's say, apartments C and D, mm -hmm. uh, maybe at the end of the hallway. And exactly. so all of a sudden you can sort of lay out the apartment so that the door that's further closer to the elevators, if you will, would become the main door. And then there's a negotiation, which sometimes can actually take quite a bit of time, yeah. which is what is the value that the board is going to put or what's the building's cost for 12 square feet or 18 square feet. Mm -hmm. If the numbers can be worked out and a fair value is being given to them, uh, as long as there's no, no wall changes that are impacting a staircase, uh, making any uh, um, dead end, what we call a dead end is uh, creating a circumstance where you are not uh, no longer able to get to a staircase in the safest way and that the, the length of the hallway is being uh, adversely affected by the combination or the area. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time it should work, but there are ways that I could see how it could be detrimental to the egress of the building. Right. Um, and, and then the next aspect to that is um, an aesthetic concern. Mm -hmm. um, you have to make sure that if you are doing a hallway absorption to the unit, um, that the unit is also no, uh, not too big for having that door sealed. Because if you're taking the hallway, you have to make sure that the, the apartment door that you're leaving doesn't put you too far from the furthest points within the apartment. You can imagine for safety reasons, one mm -hmm. shouldn't have to be trekking, uh, you know, uh, 300 feet through an apartment to get to the door. So and then, of course, so you're talking about maximum travel distance yeah. to a point of egress. That's correct. And then the, the last part is aesthetic. Uh, that hallway, which somebody is taking over, 
-hmm. will have a wallpaper or a paint surface that has been there maybe sometimes for a very long time mm -hmm. and matching that and figuring out how that's going to look pretty seamless, which is usually what most boards would want when the combination and the modification of the hallway, mm -hmm. that the molding that's running around, that the light fixtures, that the ceiling, that it's, 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 this is one of those surgeries that really needs to be uh, look like it was uh, never done. And that's usually the goal. So architecturally, sometimes we have to be very careful about how that's being done because the materials may not be available. And so there's going to have to be a negotiation about what that floor and how that end of that absorbed hallway might look. Makes sense. Got it. Thank you. So um, during the process of an alteration, this is sort of an opportunity. I think a lot of people don't realize that. So uh, Juan touched on it just earlier about the risers um, and things like that. So from those risers, you get branch piping from the, whether that's an electrical riser, a waste vent riser, a uh, supply, a uh, water supply plumbing riser, everything, everything connects back to those main risers, right? So, but in an older building, when you do renovations, one common practice that buildings have is they put onto the person renovating the owner, the shareholder, the incremental replacement uh, of some of that infrastructure. And what they can put on, on you is uh, branch piping. And that's either branch piping or branch cabling. So meaning your, uh, say your electrical sub panel leading back to the, the main electrical feed or the uh, the pipe that goes to the from the from the drain riser back to your new shower, those sorts of things. That way, uh, they know that because because an alteration will it it's like surgery. That's a that Juan actually used that word as well. It is disturbing to an existing condition, right? It 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 creates vibration. It uh, there's there's cracking. There's all kinds of things that happen when you start to sort of rattle the cage of an apartment, right? Especially in an old building, and so that's the point when it makes sense to do some of that incremental uh, infrastructure replacement. So Juan, could you touch on um, your experience with some of these items and, and what you've seen or and, and what, what people's misconceptions might be about uh, these incremental replacements? Because I think some people in our building say, oh, I'm just renovating my bathroom. Why do I need to replace all this plumbing piping? Or why do I have to do this, this sub panel or what have you? And I, I think that's where we sometimes give advice to clients about um, sometimes clients come to us, architects, and uh, they have a vision of like doing this gut renovation or doing a lot of work. And they, they say that, but when you start talking about what it means, then you have to start putting back. And, and usually our advice can sometimes be to no longer do as much work as they were thinking. And what do I mean by that? Clients sometimes are like, oh, I just wish I could put like my sink in this corner instead of where it is. But moving that sink and the pipes, maybe just six inches, could wind up forcing them to actually rip open that entire wall to get the sink shaved over. And so there are times when we actually advise our clients, you know, the value of that is very little, but you're going to have to do a lot more work because you're going to have to open up the wall instead of now replacing the fixtures as in a previous version of a renovation type and saying, I'm taking my toilet, my sink, and I'm leaving my tub and I'm just replacing it all. I'm going to basically take the tile and do a more cosmetic renovation all of a sudden, by moving a plumbing fixture, you put yourself into a completely different category and the benefits may be good. And clients sometimes may think, I don't care. Uh, the economic uh, circumstances are not an issue. Fine. But at least you're consciously knowing that you're increasing your cost or your job by 15, 20 grand just to move that sink over because you have to now take the wall open, do all the branch plumbing that is in, on the list here, the horizontal connections, get a plumber to do all of that work. We do the copper connections, make sure that it's got uh, the arresters for the, for, the, for the air when you, you're using any of the, uh, the vape, the, uh, the, any of the uh, plumbing fixtures and you're redoing the wall in its entirety as opposed to cosmetically changing the bathroom. So there are times when we actually apply the brakes on the intention of some shareholders. They save a lot of money, they save a lot of time and uh, it is actually not beneficial to sometimes do that. If you're gutting a bathroom and you're doing a lot of things, then it's actually irrelevant at that point. You should put everything new. It's the right thing to do. Nobody ever wants to be the person who finishes a full renovation of a bathroom and finds out that they have a leak because they left the old thing in the wall. After you spent $25,000, $30,000, $40,000 on the bathroom to sink it, you, you, you saved yourself $1,500. It's uh, really obviously that nobody wants to be in that situation. I think, and I 100% I agree. And I, I think it's very interesting that People also don't realize that you can you can you can do a lot in a bathroom. Like 
you can replace all the fixtures in the exact same location without pulling a permit. Um, and like be very want... trans and Chris and be very transformative about what that yeah. bathroom looks like when you're finished and be very happy uh, with the bathroom that right I think people I think that yeah I think like you said I think people a lot of times they think oh I want to rearrange the whole thing but you may not need to necessarily right In and you also may trigger new requirements we didn't we don't have a big slide about this but it's worth touching on um uh accessibility um mm -hmm. that opens up the, a can of worms on accessibility as well right mm -hmm. yeah can boards request or put it into an agreement, their alteration agreements, that these things are done if you're making changes to your building? Or we highly recommend that they put them into their agreements. Where, where is the time? <laughs> How do you amend it? Well, I mean, okay. So, well, uh, you know, a lot of different, I mean, most buildings have their own versions of the agreements. With our management company at ACAM, we have a sample alteration agreement where we've had extensive conversations with architects like Juan in order to prepare, prepare a best practices package. Um, and we recommend that boards review it with their attorneys and then either use it in whole or in part in order to make sure that their agreement is sort of up to date as possible and include best practices. Incremental infrastructure uh, replacements or updates is a highly recommended best practice. And uh, I, I, if I could... Yeah, I was going to say it also allows the building to maintain itself when people are putting in these improvements, right? That's correct. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, what, what, yeah, one of the things I want to highlight that's on this list, and uh, it seems very, very simple, but it's I think the most valuable thing is that plumbing shutoff valves requirement that buildings have. Um, if, if one were to think about the fact that, um, and, and people have, if, if in your building you see the note on the elevator that says, hey, don't use your shower on Monday from 9 to 12, the A line, right? Uh, well, guess what? That's happening because nobody can use that because there is no shutoff valves. And whenever somebody does some plumbing work on the line, every single unit on that line has the water connected through the pipes with no separations and no stoppages. So the entire vertical line for 20 stories, everybody's water is connected and nobody can shut anything off. Those valves, when we install them, it's like, and they're, they're easy to put in behind the sink side. You don't have to see the little thing, et cetera. That means in the future, when you actually have any issue with your bathroom, the toilet is leaking, your sink has a problem, et cetera. You just have to call, get those shut off right in your bathroom. And you can work on your bathroom without having to get special crazy uh, requirements and, and delays with everyone and your neighbors. And if everybody does that a little bit at a time, eventually your building or your property will at some point, obviously have enough isolated apartments so that the, the the connections are individual and you stop having to be uh, impacting your entire building lines every single time you have to do something to address a small leak even or gasket something simple definitely um so we're going to take a minute and talk about the different types of permits we won't go too into the weeds on this but the long and short is that there are a few different permit types so the most common permit types i think we're usually talking about here uh is what's formally called an alt type two which is a no change to use egress or occupancy. And I will point out that, you know, if you're combining apartments, it used to be you, technically you're chaining the occupancy, right? Because now I have one apartment, not two, but you're actually reducing the load on the building, right? Because and you and you have to take out a kitchen to do that. But they've allowed there's a there's actually a they made a change in the law where you can actually do apartment combination under an alt type two or what's called an alt, uh, just a regular alt, not an alt co. Um, the limited alteration application we talked about is the permit that you would be pulling if you're replacing your gas stove alone and the gas stove replacement is not under the umbrella um, uh, of your of a bigger alteration. And then there's ordinary plumbing work, which is an OP-128, um, which is I'm going to swap out my toilet, for example. You don't actually need a full, uh, you don't need a full permit. Um, I'm curious to know, uh, Juan, if you've had any um, you know, what, what issues you've had with permits or concerns, this is not including LPC permits, which is a separate issue, but any, any, anything you want to add here? No, I, I think these four categories are very clear, uh, from the most serious requirements at the top to the least amount of requirements at the bottom. I would also just highlight that for the first two, which are like what we would call construction projects, mm -hmm. uh, a construction project be it me moving one wall over and making a room a bigger and moving a door, mm -hmm. that wall that we just talked about 
will require the same exact amount of paperwork and process as if you're gutting your entire apartment down to the slab and yeah. relaying it out completely. The DOB sees those two things exactly the same way. And what do I mean by that? That one wall that has to move, which requires a permit, you have to go and request a inspection for asbestos and hazardous materials. That testing will cost you some money. It will identify, especially if you have a building that was built in the era of the 50s and 60s or in that general area, highly likely that something may have asbestos, the glue underneath your kitchen floor or uh, something, the, the glue or the tiles in your closets, right? It, it could be also be very simple things, but then you have to abate that. Um, you'd have to pay fees. You have to prepare paperwork, submit those two renovations to your building for the architects and engineers to review them, go through that entire process, the agreement. So one wall moving and an entire apartment being gutted, the same process. And a lot of times that's actually one of the toughest things to explain to people who come with a very small project that even though it's a very small project and it sounds really simple on paper, it requires all of the same things pulling the permits, getting a contract of this license, getting all of the paperwork done in the building and at the Department of Buildings, the insurance issues. At the end of the one wall that moves or at the end of the gut renovation, signing it off, getting it inspected, paying the sign off fees with your building, getting it reviewed and finally getting it closed out at the DOB. The, the $5,000 wall move and the $1.2 million renovation, the same process. Now, of course, they do have a different cost and amount of intensity of work and time, but the processes are the same. And that's actually one of the things that sometimes is tough to tough to swallow. Until they the, until they make changes to the to the rules and laws, right? Yeah, that's the way it is. And but so, let me let me could I could I ask you about the, one of the most common things that I hear and see all the time, and I'm sure Elise will agree with me on this one. Everybody says they're looking at an apartment and they say, Oh, I just want to throw up a wall and, <laughs> and make another bedroom. What are the implications of that? I know everybody wants to know why can't I just add a wall and make a bedroom? What's what's what what's the what what are the um I guess what are the hurdles on something like that? This is for Elisa or for me. No, this for you. no, this is for you. I think she will agree that this is as a broker, a former broker, yeah. I'm sure she heard that one all okay. the time. So 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 that's exactly that's exactly the project I just described a minute ago. Instead of taking the wall down, I want to put up a wall, right? So that's right. the same thing. That entire process is the same for that one wall, right? Except that one wall needs to go in a place where it's legally possible. What does yeah. that mean? Yes. When that wall is going up. Make sure that you have a window. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you can get a door that is wide enough to comply with the code and make sure that that said room has a certain size and has ceiling height. So like, it's also important to realize that there are limitations on what that quote unquote habitable new room that you're making is going to be doing. And that that wall doesn't take away the window from some other space because maybe there's only one window and you can't just take one window and assume one space doesn't have one and the other one does. So, so why can't I have a room issue. without a window? Uh, only of a certain size because, um, and these laws are very interesting historically. In office, right? uh, you can't even do that unless there's a certain size issues about that, a home office. Uh, because the intent of a room without a window means that if somebody is in that space, it's technically an unhealthy environment for you to spend a lot of time in. You don't have ventilation. You don't have access to natural light. Um, God forbid there's an issue. You actually can't have a fire engine come up to your window or whatever it might be. These laws also are born from the most simple uh, historical reasons. I encourage anybody who's on this call, anybody go to the tenement, build the tenement museum in the Lower East Side. Uh, it's a wonderful story about how the building codes in New York City instead grew. Because unfortunately, in 1910, people would rent apartments and they would put 12 people to live in a little room and they would have no window and maybe not even a bathroom. Mm -hmm. And the laws are coming from um, abusive landlord tenant situations that happened uh, 100 years ago. And uh, they made some really good rules that are still on the books, have been adjusted over the years. But I think it's pretty wise to have a code that says, you know what, nobody should be living in a room that has no window. And, uh, and there's a good reason for that because it's a ventilation issue. It's a safety issue. And uh, let's talk about it. Nowadays, I think it's important. It's a mental health wellness issue as well. Um, mm -hmm. And all of those things mean that the code says so. Oh, but it's just for my crib. It's just my new kid. I, you know, but guess what? That may be okay. In your mind, you think it's okay. But if it's another person who then winds up putting an adult in a room like that or three adults in a room like that, you can see obviously how that uh, cascades. 
a really high-end Tribeca apartment or somewhere on some neighborhood out in Queens that's very expensive, they may be, they would never do that. But there's a lot of fabric in New York City where there's a lot of nooks and crannies and you obviously want to protect people from being put into circumstances that are unsafe. And so the code doesn't care if it's a really wealthy apartment in Tribeca or it's a tiny, little tiny uh, apartment in another neighborhood in the city. The laws are the laws. And it's good that they're out there, but that's why they exist. Because there are people who would do things that would be very detrimental with those laws not being on the books. What about temporary walls? I remember this came up all the time. Yeah, pressurized walls, right? right? Pressurized Can I walls. have those? Yeah. Again, uh, if people were to be able to do those, then you could create a little grid of them and um, have situations that also would be unsafe. And so I think that's why they have registered engineers and registered architects who technically were supposed to be helping to make sure that we have safe or unsafe conditions for uh, residents. Uh, and those type of walls also, somebody puts one up in the wrong place, they block a sprinkler head, and all of a sudden you have a room that has absolutely zero coverage from the sprinkler heads that might need to be there and uh, or, or other things that um, are obviously create unsafe conditions, which is why these rules exist. Do I need a, do I need a permit for a pressurized wall? Yeah. Uh, you're not allowed to put a partition up to subdivide spaces um, without getting a permit. Regardless of whether it's temporary. That's correct, because temporary is how long, uh, Chris? Is that for two, three days or are you going to leave it up for five years? Mm -hmm. okay. Got it. So those walls, like where they used to put the partitions, and then you have like the space in between, just so it's not going all the way up to the ceiling. You still that's, need. A no, that's different. If you can yeah. keep your quote unquote partition uh, mm -hmm. eighteen inches clear from the top. Okay. Uh, usually, that's the general rule of thumb that I would say. But but because then it becomes a screen or a shoji screen or some partition that could be a, a foldable inches. partition. Then you're talking about a movable object that's a partition and that would be acceptable. So yeah. a bookshelf or furniture. That is correct. Something removable, that's movable. Right. But even a partition wall. Interesting, okay. Yeah, yeah, as soon as you start putting studs and sheetrock up, that's a, usually a bad sign that you're putting up a wall. Okay, helpful. Okay, so with regard to the alteration process, um, different boards are different, their packages are different. This is a pretty typical alteration package submittal. So when you're gathering stuff, don't think, oh, you just hire an architect or a lot of people I think think they can do the entire process with just a contractor. Um, unfortunately, I, in my experience, I don't know if this is Juan's experience of contractors are really good at building things, but not necessarily really good at build paperwork per se. So you really, need to make sure that you have a, a good architect, a good designer to help you with this whole process. And you can see the list of items here, um, including a scope of work, which is usually a written description, any required permits. Uh, that includes landmark preservation certificates, either no effect or appropriateness if you're in a landmark district or a landmark building, the construction documents themselves. And that's the approved permitted on-site documents. Um, you have your the licenses and certificates of insurance. Every building has different requirements. Um, some buildings require, they want to see what the contracts are. You know, I think we recommend AIA contracts typically because they're so vetted by dozens of lawyers. Um, the asbestos report, have you done your report? Have you done your testing? Like Juan mentioned, load letters and board approvals. Um, is there anything, Juan, that uh, you feel here that is missing from the list or maybe are more onerous than others as a part of preparing the submittal package or what are the hurdles in submitting the package and what's the purpose of the package? Like, why do I need to gather 16 million things all at once? Uh, I guess the package is a really good checklist to make sure that everybody's protected, I guess is what my answer would be. Uh, protection uh, for, um, uh, for the building as a whole, right? Uh, insurance, uh, et cetera, uh, pretty obvious reasons why the building would want to be protected. Uh, the shareholder, even though they might find this onerous, like you said, guess what? It means that they're probably less likely to hire somebody who might take advantage of them or really be a shoddy builder. Uh, now, of course, there's no guarantees on that, but at least if somebody is going through the trouble to have all of this paperwork, this does protect most shareholders from hiring uh, a chop shop or some contractor who's uh, got a lot of trouble. Uh, 
most contractors, and I thankfully I don't know any of them, um, that would be sort of, let's call it a blacklist of sorts, um, they probably wouldn't be able to bother dealing with this, right? And so they probably have really bad insurance rates. They can't fulfill the insurance requirements. Uh, if they've got problems with the DOB, they won't be able to pull permits. They won't be able to like get, a, get anything uh, filed over there. So it protects the shareholder from potentially having a, a scamming situation. We've all heard the renovation nightmares. I'm that surprised there's not the, a TV show, actually. Yeah, well, <laughs> and what I mean by that is like the contractor who starts a job, takes the money and disappears, right? Or they start throwing work together. Or, hey, the contractor who's got one guy there two times a week trying to get something done that's going to take them forever. And again, these things will protect the shareholders because the good contractors, even though they might also cost a little bit more money, they're probably going to get the job done. They're probably more legitimate. So I think the package is protecting everybody involved. Chris, we've been seeing some false COIs lately, right? We have. In fact, um, we, we've had contractors who may fall into the bucket that you were just mentioning who aren't, who aren't necessarily above board, and they have tried to uh, submit a fraudulent COI, COIs that were essentially uh, you know, made up, and we've been able to catch them because we have our own in-house risk manager. Um, I think uh, it's also interesting to make sure that uh, you see the policy of your contractor, not just the COI, because the COI, there could be exceptions uh, in, in the COI and or in the policy that aren't reflected in the COI, right? They might say, oh, we can do this type of work, but not if you're next to a dry cleaner or there's all kinds of weird rules and regulations and you want to make sure that they align. So some boards may require to see the policy of the contractor. You also want to make sure that contractors licenses are also current. That's another, that's another issue in the city, you know? Um, uh, and I think if you, and I know this isn't here in the package per se, but um, making sure that you're following through on all the paperwork across the board is important because if, if your project isn't properly signed off and then a contractor has his license revoked, a plumber has their license revoked, then it can put your entire alteration in jeopardy and you have to then go back with new professionals to sort of unwind or someone like Juan has to supersede your other architect's work and that sort of thing. Have you experienced anything like that, Juan? Uh, yes, and I was actually gonna say that um, doing things without following the procedures is only kicking the can potentially down the road. And what do I mean by that is the person who maybe, and some of the, most of the buildings that you're dealing with are probably fairly substantial, have a, a very sort of active board. So they might be 200 units, 300 units, right? But even a small building with five units or six units, sometimes what we found is the smaller buildings where basically everybody's on the board, right? It's a very intimate group. They may elect themselves to follow less rules. And mm -hmm. what that means is that they're gonna let more go because um, they're basically quote unquote supervising themselves. They don't wanna to put too much arduous work on themselves. But guess what? When somebody goes and does renovation work or moves things around and they don't get the permits and stuff and everything goes really well, Six years later, they go and sell the apartment or they want to sell the apartment. Right. I've walked in with buyers and clients of mine who are going to buy units and do this. And the first thing that we do is like, okay, great. And their attorney says, hey, show me, uh, show me the legal uh, conditions for this apartment and this, and this situation. And nobody can show that. And all of a sudden there's a buyer who's now going to have to decide if they're going to buy an apartment that is an illegal layout that may have issues that transaction may fall through the cracks and may, may be an issue. That, that seller has to now either fork over a negotiated adjustment to the cost or have to go back and do what Chris just said is now spend a whole bunch of money in a very emergency situation, expediting everything, paying through the nose to legalize their unit so that they can then have a transaction and sell it because the attorney, attorneys aren't gonna let somebody go buy a unit that has an illegal, um, uh, unfiled, unpermitted job. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of liability there. So, so doing yeah. things right usually does pay off. I would say is uh, is the general goal. Uh, I've definitely of, had that happen with clients where they had to put off their closing for like eight months until it was a townhouse and they didn't file and it was just waiting, 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 but it wasn't done. And yeah, I was putting say, a lot of money in an escrow account somewhere and things yeah. like that. And also, I would just say it's not a DIY friendly <laughs> city when it comes to doing your own work in your own apartment. I mean, it just, there's too many things that you have to, you know, get through as far as hurdles are concerned. So, you know, maybe on your own apartment, but this is again, communal living, so. Yeah. Correct, and that's where the protection 
of the of the 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 group or the entity is the reason why these packages are important. And then Chris, you know, when boards come to us and you know they have they don't even know where their alteration agreements are and you know they're old and so what is the process for our boards with that when they're coming as newer clients, you know, to help them adjust that? I mean, a couple, you know, a couple of things. I would say, you know, often we will, uh, you know, we'll review those agreements um, ourselves. Um, I reviewed and redlined many, many agreements that just said, "Hey, I, you know, we can't tell any, we can't tell anybody what to do per se, but we can offer best practices." And when I review an old agreement, often I will look for things that I think that should be there that we we covered here, especially like infrastructure. Uh, upgrades and sort of things that you do or don't allow like whatever dry or washer dryers and things like that just you know you know suggest that those things be altered what we can do from a management company's perspective is you know make a bunch of suggestions um based on a red line and or provide our uh baseline agreement our sample alteration package and then give it back to the board and have the board review it themselves with their attorney because they need to review it with their own attorney before they put anything into place. Um, but a lot of the legwork is done. So you're not paying the attorney, um, you know, hours and hours of their fees and they like, they're really good at billing. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe I was in the way, maybe Juan and I are in the wrong profession. <laughs> and, um, but we, we do a lot of legwork that way. You're just, you're, you're taking a lot of uh, a lot of the uh, the heavy lifting and then bringing it over to your attorney and they can do the final pass and say, yes, this makes sense or no, this doesn't make sense or we want to make it, you know, uh, make a bigger hurdle or uh, what have you and then uh, put the final uh, blessing on it before then it's then uh, cemented into the building's uh, laws and then distributed to residents moving forward. Um, and then as a management company, we typically act as sort of the the bridge uh, between the owner shareholder and the board and the building's reviewing architect. And that's why it's really important on these packages to make sure that it's, you have all the pieces because we're just going to kick it back if you don't have all the pieces. And often uh, in my experience, I don't know if Juan's experience is, I'm sure it's not, your experience is not the same, which is why you're on this call is because you're a very good architect. But in my experience, when the packages are incomplete, it's because the contractor architect either didn't read the agreement didn't put together all the pieces or was trying to run roughshod over the entire process. And if you just if if you just hire a very competent professional who is willing to do the diligence and do the reading, he actually cuts down on the time of that process. Because if all the ducks are in a row, it just goes smoother. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, absolutely. In fact, uh, the alternation agreement is... Uh, when there's a potential client, it's the first thing I ask them to request from their broker who's going to get in touch with the selling broker to see if, if it's a transaction that still needs to take place. Uh, the one thing I wanted to also flag from this package submittal that I think is really important, and we face it as architects who renovate in buildings, et cetera, is the timeframes for the renovation and yeah. the implications of time in penalty clauses, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, I've seen many different variables of this in many buildings from buildings where they just say you have 120 days, you have 180 days, and the building will say, shareholder, if you hire a contractor and they don't do this and they don't finish on time, we're going to start charging you this much money per day. Uh, and those buildings do have very serious implications, and that's also protection for the whole. Who wants to be living next to a renovation that's going on and on and on and on, right? You don't want to be that neighbor, and you also want your apartment ready so you can move in and go and live in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so dragging out a construction project unnecessarily, things happen, right? Mm -hmm. But that is a very key point is the timeframes that a lot of the alter issue grants require because I've had to actually advise clients on trying to help them define what is completion of project and can we paint after 120 days? Because sometimes people are doing a lot of work and it does take time to get things in and out of a building and the elevators, et cetera. Um, or figuring out how much you can do before the permit actually is triggered, right? And, and I do, my job is also to sometimes help advise safely to find little ways to get a little bit of a buffer zone at the beginning of a time frame, a little bit at the end of the time frame, all proper. But nonetheless, if one can strip down curtains and take down things that are like cosmetic, et cetera, and start getting debris out and not trigger your permit, that means that you aren't doing construction, but at least we're getting a week's worth of work that saves us on the end. 
And the timeframes for alterations are, I think, are really important to protect everybody, but it's also something that shareholders should always take really serious note of. It's interesting you say that because I had a conversation earlier today uh, with our senior vice president of operations regarding what what, they, what he's calling the Seinfeld rule. My understanding is it actually came from literally Jerry Seinfeld renovating and combining four apartments for himself and his renovation went on and on and on and on that this idea of charging owners and shareholders who go beyond the 120, 180 days will allow them to sort of compensate the building for that. And, and some, some, some uh, owners and shareholders are able to pay that $500 to $5,000 a day, whatever it is, the clause is. It's a great way to, I guess, fill the coffers of the building uh, if you're in a situation like that as well. On on the one hand, on the other hand, also, like you said, to um, you know, reduce, re minimize the impact on the, the on the neighbors in the building. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. I was yeah, going to say labor shortage and material costs and and all that. Though there is that end of things where it just new problem. estimated that it's going to take a little longer, right? I mean, the reality is, I I think previous to COVID, that's the timing is just definitely a consideration. Yeah, yes, but I still believe in a, a proper planning. Uh, can can address that. Yes, you're right. And things happen, unexpected items that may be delayed, or you get the broken one, and it's like, oh my God, the 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 broken thing is can't be replaced for two months. So the things do happen that are very impactful sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, and and the key is to just also like whenever renovations take place, just being a proper good neighbor will save a ton a ton of stress. Letting people know when the noise is uh, is going to take place, putting the notices about the dust, and just being good, that just goes over really well. Because the other thing that I've seen happen, and sort of like what happens with renovations, is contractors who just don't follow the rules and they make a mess of stuff, and they wind up stopping the jobs for a couple of weeks, etc., just by not putting masonite on the hallways or whatever it might be, and uh, and and laying down the law for contractors, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen in several instances where uh, owners will they will tell their contractors, I want you to make sure that my neighbors are happy. They will check in with the neighbors. They, Do you need a light bulb replaced? Go that extra mile and your neighbors will. I've seen not so much in you know large unit buildings, but more townhouses willing to like replace fences for the neighbors or flat work or things like that, just to keep the neighbor happy, knowing that they're going to be living next to a construction site for a while. So I think that, you know, going above and beyond with their contractor, whether or not you're, whether, whether you're, laying down the law, so to speak, or whether you are um, having your contractor and and putting the the monetary on yourself, uh, making sure they go out of their way to make sure that your neighbors are happy is an ounce of prevention worth a pound of cure. Yeah, and, and I'll just add that the reality is that the system has been improved drastically over the years. Mm -hmm. Calling 311 and the DOB, they've gotten really efficient. There's going to be somebody there that afternoon. And if they think there's something going on that needs to be stopped, that's going to get stopped and you would be surprised how long it takes sometimes to get something very minor cleared up with the DOB so you can keep working on a job site. And and I will say that you might be shooting your your building in the foot. You're going to be doing work on your apartment, you don't go that you don't do that extra mile. An inspector comes out, they're there for that one thing, but when inspectors are in your building, they start looking around and that could hurt the balance of the building if they see something um, that they don't like, or you're starting to issue permits and things like that. So you could actually affect the balance of your community in an adverse way. Chris, how do we prevent issues like that from happening? Like, I know that we've spoken on this before, you know, how do you prevent people from doing work that they shouldn't be doing to, op you know, create the building having a havoc as opposed to just the individual unit owner? Um, I mean, I, I think, I think, you know, Juan said it, you know, following the proper protocols and procedures set both by the DOB and by the building. But like, can uh, the building, like, should the manager or the super, someone be checking in on the work to make yeah, sure? Yeah, we're going to, we're, yeah, I think that's the next slide, actually. Huh, see? Genius. <laughs> yeah, because I guess the, the submission is in, now we have to do some work. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So what is the next slide? Milestones. Great. So, exactly. So, essentially, we want to, you, the question is, is, there are certain milestones that as you do a project, your architect is going to be looking into or your engineer and your contractor is going to be, it may have a required inspections with the city, but I think that these are great inspection milestones here. So there's the official DOB inspection, and then there are just, I'm going to take a look at something inspection, which is not an official inspection, 
but uh, useful nonetheless. So these are some inspection milestones that we recommend that boards consider as a part of the alteration process to ensure that the things are going according to plan. Because there are some shareholders who will say, here, here's my plan. This is what I'm going to do. And then they end up deviating from the course of what they said they were going to do. Um, sometimes honest, uh, you know, I just changed my mind last minute, sometimes dishonest, meaning they never intended to disclose that thing that they're not necessarily allowed to do. So as a result, in order to protect the building uh, and, and even technically the shareholder from something like a stop work order, which I think Juan was alluding to in his last comment about getting something started again, these are some really great inspection milestones. Could you could you talk through a couple of the of the big ones, Juan, and your experience with them, and who should be doing these? Well, so I've had clients, and if I can just widen the conversation for a moment, as an architect, we would comply with the rules and regulations of filing drawings, but it's an optional service. Sometimes I, I we basically do it for all of our clients, but it's an optional service sometimes. Uh, clients would choose to so to say, you know, once it's approved by the building, like I don't need anybody to kind of take a look at anything. And they might say, oh, I'll just call you when I need you. Uh, and owners can do that. And but but a lot of alteration agreements actually require the architects to actually go there and or the architects uh, for the actual building management to go to the property. Reviewing some of the work that's listed here, uh, the waterproofing is fairly uh, obvious. It's making sure that bef before you tile, before you finish your bathroom or your kitchen, that the waterproofing is down, that actually first that it's down and two, that it's down properly because uh, you can put it down, but if it's not done correctly, it's, it's like worthless. we might as well not have put it in there, right? So uh, we've had to ourselves and we've had supers go during construction and notice that somebody's doing something pretty sloppily. We don't visit the job site every day. Usually once a week is about a, a approximate schedule, but work is happening. Uh, so checking on those kinds of things and making sure the materials are down is really important. We found that making sure that the contractors take photographs of everything they do, and a good contractor will do that on their own, but getting them to send you pictures, right? It's very easy with a phone these days, getting a lot of photographs, and that tells everybody a lot about what's going on and the documentation. Because if nobody sees something, at least you have a good photograph, you might be able to sort of say, no, I did this, or I didn't do that, et cetera. Um, the city will need to come to a job site to review plumbing work, and electrical work. Now the plumbing work is one where I'm gonna kind of talk about it. There's two aspects of a plumbing inspection. It's the rough plumbing inspection and there's a finished plumbing inspection. Most jobs of plumbing work will have those. And those would mean that the city is going to come to the job site, look at the rough plumbing, which is when the wall is open, all the new pipes are installed, no fixtures, but all the pipes are all in there, the supply lines and the waste lines, everything's there, the skeleton of, of the plumbing and the city would look at it. But there's an exception when the inspection is requested, if the plumbing inspector does not show up by a certain amount of time, the master plumber that, um, that was mentioned earlier by Chris, they can self-certify and they basically say, you know, I'm responsible for the plumbing. I don't need the city to look at it. Let's close the walls up. And that's okay. And it happens all the time. But of course, if the city does show up, they will look at it. The electrical inspection happens at the very end of the project, and it's actually one of the more minor ones. It has to be done well, but we do trust the craftspeople and the licensed people that do work in the city. The licensed electrician should be a very competent person, should be a competent professional who's licensed by the state and, and should be able to do their work. So all of that work gets done. There's really no inspection until the very, very end. Um, and at the very end, the plumbing inspection happens the second version, which is down. all the fixtures are in place. Everything should be working. You should be able to flip your faucet and get your hot water and you should be able to flush your toilet bowl. And the inspection at the end is just to make sure that you didn't put more things that you needed to or put them in properly and that they're all in the right places. Those are the city inspectors, but the architects and engineers who file the drawings usually are also responsible for signing off the job. And so we as professionals usually come at the end of the job to make sure everything matches the drawings and that everything's been built accordingly. All of those checks and balances usually keep everything fairly straightforward. And uh, there's enough checks and balances by either the professionals from the license or the plumbing or the architects and engineers that at the end, most clients should end up with a properly reviewed and a properly inspected project. 
they shouldn't be doing that themselves, to be honest with you. Can you can you touch on what's considered special inspections versus the standard inspections you just mentioned, the electrical, the the rough and the rough and finished inspections? What's a special inspection? And can the you give deal, us an example? Sure. So uh, if one was to ever approach the DOB for the forms and the documentation, as you can imagine, um, between a renovation of an apartment and somebody putting up a 50-story building, the forms are actually the same. Uh, and those forms are identical. There's other ones for the 50-story building, but the forms are actually the same. And the 50-story building has a sheet that says, I need to inspect uh, mechanical inspections for ventilation. I need to check uh, concrete. I could do all lots of stuff. So of course, a lot of those are not required for the apartment renovation. Focusing on the apartment renovation though, there's mechanical work, for example, most bathrooms, unless they have a window, we will have a vent uh, that goes into a shaft that is eventually the shaft that goes through the building, which is connected to everybody else's bathrooms or apartments or kitchens, depending on what we're talking about. Those technically, if you move them, touch them, et cetera, is mechanical work. That's a special inspection that would require a professional. It could be an engineer or an architect who can sign those off because you have to be able to do those inspections properly. That's a special inspection that has to be then verified. A professional like myself could say it's done well. I'm stamping and signing that it's been done correctly and I'm going to approve the work as, as it was done. And that's an example of a typical inspection that you might have as a special inspection in an apartment renovation. The second one that I would flag as a possible one would be something like, which we've had to do many times, which is putting a through wall unit in a building, let's say, or a window, uh, underneath a window, having to put, let's say, a small angle or a lintel that's really for an AC unit or a split system or some sort of mechanical system. Structurally, technically, that's an inspection that one, one needs to make sure that the angle is properly laid out, that it's overlapping on the edges properly, that it's not gonna collapse, that it's not gonna fall. And that's another kind of inspection. But most renovations have those kinds of things and the fireproofing ones. But um, it's, so it's fairly limited, but you do need to hire professionals that are independent from the contractor who are going to come and check the work. And again, that's another checks and balances that exist. So it's process. another person that you have to hire because they're yeah. basically looking at the work of the contractor and making sure the contractor followed your drawings, the architect's drawings. So you're, so, so I think people, I think that's a great thing to note is that most people don't realize how many people are actually involved in a simple renovation. You have an architect, a contractor, a special inspector, an expediter. There's like five different people just to like, you know, clean, you know, renovate your bathroom. Yeah, actually a question came in that kind of touches on that. And it's about, you know, the simplicity of just adding a sinkful sink replacement. And, you know, if it's just an ordinary plumbing work, is the permit required? And why must a licensed master plumber not the super perform that work? So a, a sink, a sink it, correct me if I'm wrong, Juan, but, my, uh, you know, uh, uh, an in-kind replacement of sink on the existing branch piping in the exact same location does not require a permit or a licensed master plumber. Correct. If it's if I'm going to change the, for example, a lot of people say, oh, well, I want to put a shower where my tub is. People don't realize, well, it's kind of the same. It seems to be kind of like the same fixture in the same location. But I don't think most people realize is that because a, because a tub can hold water as it drains, the size of the branch line is different than the size of the branch line of a shower, which is why you need a permit. That Correct. also the same idea. Yeah, or, or, or the location of the drain is just a different location as well. You got to yep, move you it. Mo right, moved. Yep. Got it. Sorry to interrupt. No, I was going to ask, is that the same concept of the washer dryer? A lot of people say, oh, I'd rather have a washer dryer than this like very teeny tiny pocket of a bathroom. So is that similar concept as to why you would need, you know, specific permitting or well, if you're adding it, if you're adding an entirely new pic fixture that doesn't e exist, then you need a permit. And then right. it's also an interesting point of contention, the, the washer dryer situation, because many buildings, washers create suds. In some buildings, their infrastructure, the lines are not big enough in order to support that type of appliance, right? So that's very important that if you say, oh, well, we're considering having every, allowing everybody in their alterations to put in washers and dryers because it's a wonderful thing to have, we highly recommend that a mechanical, an MEP, also known as a mechanical, electrical, or plumbing engineer, review the infrastructure of your building before you allow something like that on your building. So, and, and some people have already done that in their buildings and in your alteration package, it will be listed under prohibited work. You cannot do that. So uh, your reviewing architect will then 
write in his letter, sorry, you're going to have to cross off this wonderful stack washer dryer you were hoping to have because it's, it's prohibited work. Yeah, the washer dryer triggers uh, acoustical issues for vibration. Uh, it triggers ventilation issues. If you don't do a self-venting unit, you can't just uh, nitty gritty make a hole in the side of your uh, brick wall and uh, vent out laterally. Mm -hmm. You could technically, but uh, most buildings wouldn't uh, uh, want to, to have people just poking holes on the brick walls um, uh, without making sure that it's done correctly. And then you wanna make sure that when you do that, if you think you can do that, that you're not just venting your dryer and then your neighbor has uh, to smell your dryer every single time you use it because their window is right above you. So again, there's a lot of good reasons why these rules exist. It's about you living with a lot of people close to each other. And let's not forget uh, uh, pans with leak detectors. Yeah. Um, I think that really does cover the best practice for dwelling units. Um, but I think the next slide is Q and A, correct? Yeah. If anybody yeah. has, if anybody has any, we've questions? actually covered. I was peppering a few through, so fortunately, Fantastic. we've had a lot answered. Um, but let me just pull up a few more because um, I know that we're we're probably nearing people's dinner times. Um, but let me pull up a few. So ours, ours included. <laughs> yeah, so we did discuss. <laughs> I know you're hungry, Chris. No, I'm kidding. Um, can I install a recessed medicine cabinet in a demising partition? Actually, that's an interesting question. Great question. Juan? Well, so let's let's just clarify what is a demising partition, right? So for the demising partition would be technically the one that is separating your apartment from your neighbor's apartment. Mm -hmm. And your apartment and your neighbor's apartment should be separated by a rating that is going to be protecting you and your neighbor from each other, God forbid, in case of a fire. So from a logical standpoint, um, the idea is that a demising partition needs to maintain the rating consistently across the entire length of that wall, because mm -hmm. this is how your fire is no longer getting from one side to the other. Mm -hmm. There are ways to put a medicine cabinet, maybe semi-recessed in a wall and mm -hmm. maintain the fire rating because you can maintain the sheetrock and wrap it around the entire thing. And there are ways to do it. But it is very rare if you're in a typical, very narrow 50s type of building where the walls are fairly thin, because mm -hmm. once you put that in there and if you try to maintain the rating, in fact, it's actually not possible to do that with a fully recessed uh, medicine cabinet. But every circumstance might be different. Some walls are going to be possible and some walls is not going to be possible. So the general rule is you have to check the specific conditions and, of course, the type of medicine cabinet. So the, the, it all factors in. The key thing to keep in mind is that if your bathroom is backing up against your neighbor's bathroom, you have to be much more careful than if your bathroom is within your apartment and is your own wall, you have more flexibility with the walls within your apartment than the ones that are adjacent to your neighbor's walls. Okay, that was great, thank you. Um, someone's asking me if I'm combining apartments, does a building need to change its certificate of occupancy? That's also a great question. So we yeah, mentioned Chris that, mentioned that earlier yeah. and the answer is no, you no longer have to uh, require a new CFO. You can combine units even more than two. Less paperwork, right? That's good. One but you do, but you do need to file. Um, you do need to file a, a change in your tax lot, if I'm not mistaken. If if it's a condo, car. that's correct. Yeah. Okay, and here's the last question, and then of course, if we didn't get to anyone's particular question, we of course are available and we'll circulate our information after tonight, so you can reach out to any one of us to get your answers. Um, but what would you guys in closing say is the hardest part about doing a renovation on the on an apartment if you had to nail it? Oh, I have a very different answer than Juan will. Okay. I, I, I have a hundred answers, but yeah. uh, no, I, it's uh, just what, what would float to my surface is uh, having a client with their goals and who has an idea. They want to improve an apartment. Maybe it's an apartment that uh, they're acquiring that has not had any work done to for 40, 50 years, right? What we call a gut renovation or an estate situation. Mm -hmm. um, having their ideas and being able to carry them through to fruition is obviously a very satisfying thing because they're making an investment. They want to make this and maybe customize this a little bit for them more for themselves. And it is the tough one. Some of the toughest conversations are like addressing the wet over dry concerns and having a bath of an apartment that in the end still is going to make them very happy but knowing that some perimeters like some bathrooms may not be able to get larger, et cetera. Um, but some apartments do lend themselves to more creative solutions because uh, what we've had uh, to do, for example, is sometimes we have uh, larger apartments, let's say on some of the Park Avenue locations like the one on the screen right now, 
-hmm. where you have um, areas near the kitchen where there are actually service areas that were tiled, et cetera. So there are times where there's more wiggle room, but obviously everyone wants to try to do the best you can for, for the clients, um, but making sure that the, the work is well-planned, um, that the, the scheduling and the contract, and that there's a really good collaborative effort between the owner, the mm -hmm. professionals that they might hire, mm -hmm. the relationship with the staff and the folks in the building and, and communication. And of course, the contractor who's going to be ultimately responsible for making sure that uh, that the that the work get, uh, gets done. Mm -hmm. For me, I'd say it's um, it's as simple as um, provided that you're following all the rules of the building and of the city, and you're following all the proper procedures and doing all the proper paperwork, and you have the proper insurance and that sort of thing. For me, it's your ability to make decisions. I think the hardest part I've always experienced as an architect in working on a project is. Um, people uh, have a hard time making decisions. And that's the thing that slows down the process the most. If you don't know what you want or you are unable to make decisions, um, I would say you, you, that's going to that's gonna be the hardest part. If you have, uh, if, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're renovating the apartment uh, uh, with somebody, I would say make sure that you get on the same page or make sure that you do as much of the decision making ahead of uh, uh, turning. Once you start the renovation process, it looks like a bomb went off, right? So you do not want to be making decisions uh, during that process. You want to make minor ones, not major ones. So uh, making decisions ahead of time. So having a rigorous design development phase with your architect, I think is going to make your life a whole heck of a lot easier. And it's going to make everything else stale through. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, changing substantial aspects of a renovation midstream uh, has a very serious domino effect. Mm -hmm. And you have to start, as far as the management company is concerned, if you make a major change, you have to go back to the building architect. You have to go back to the board. It's not the same project again. And I, it's I also a different project. Say, I think is like for a board just to be, you know, very straightforward from the start and have a very strong you know, agreement in place. So that way, when an owner, a unit owner wants to make these changes, they have an idea as to why, because, you know, as a person, a layman who used to sell real estate, you know, I'd be like, oh, you can put up a wall, don't worry about it. You know, and I would just sell the dream. But the reality is there's a lot of protections in place for, you know, the rest of the building as we keep talking about. And it's difficult for board members when, you know, this unit owner wants to make changes and now they're knocking on a board member's door to say, well, why not? You know, if it's a very straightforward agreement, then, you know, of course they shouldn't be knocking on the door of a owner anyway. But, you know, it helps, I think, it helps to have the board, you know, be advised from the beginning and the, and the unit owner be advised in the beginning. So I think it usually, that helps. I think just having a very solid agreement in place. It yeah. Just the, keep on updating. Yeah. It. And, and, yeah and, and Chris said it, hiring a good team is important. I mean, I've done, I've even combined apartments vertically uh, many times, which means a building is letting us cut a huge opening in the slab to put a staircase, to create a duplex. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's it's about doing things uh, with with a good set of drawings. Nothing is more aggravating and uh, that I've heard. I've heard nightmares of like people submitting drawings that are just inadequate, thinking mm -hmm. that um, a really poorly set, uh, prepared set of drawings are submitted that it's just going to get approved and everyone's. It just takes the confidence away from the process, and all of a sudden, everyone realizes that there's something that is going to probably already start with a series of problems. So. I usually try to advise clients to make sure that they don't just think that we can willy nilly put a set of plans together and just submit them. Because if you put something together without it looking like there's a serious effort and that has been thought through, it's a really, really big red flag for the management company who's seen a lot of good plans. So trust me, when they see some chicken scratches on a piece of paper or on a PDF, they can tell. Or when they have an architect on their staff. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so I think I think there are times when uh, even the most complex renovations, if they're handled properly, no one should not do something because they are concerned that it's it's going to be a mess and all these negative things. We're just saying, I think, as a group, that if it's properly planned and the rules are followed and some competent sets of drawings and a good contractor are put together, or a good team, and the owner, I think, has got to be a responsible party as well. Mm -hmm. um, you can do anything mm -hmm. as long as it's properly planned, making a huge change to a landmark building, putting central air conditionings uh, through walls, 
um, staircases, uh, punching through the top floors of the building because you put a bulkhead and you get direct access to a deck on a roof. I mean, it's all possible. Mm -hmm. Just make sure that you're following the, the parameters that are set forth and doing it properly. You can do almost anything as long as you do it right. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you both for your wonderful wisdom. I think hopefully our board members have come out with a better understanding of alteration agreements. Um, so here's um, Juan and Chris's information as well as mine, although I definitely recommend <laughs> the two others if you have questions about alteration agreements. I'll chat with you about what I can sell you on that you shouldn't do. Um, anyway. <laughs> Have a great night, everyone. Have a wonderful holiday season. And thank you so much for joining us. Have a great night. Bye-bye.